So uh, with that cue and Dr. Olson being always on time or one minute early, we'll go ahead and start. <laughs> and, uh, so this, is our, this is our um, combined Grand Rounds slash subspecialty uh, meeting. And today we have um, some hopefully really good talks from both of our new cornea fellows and then also Mike Murray, a resident who may be interested in, in doing a cornea fellowship. I think that's still the plan. So first we're gonna hear from Brett Gudgel. Um, Brett's here from Oklahoma where he did his residency and a lot of his training and growing up. And uh, he's gonna talk to us about um, keratoprostheses, can give us kind of a broad overview. And then Eric Weinlander, uh, who comes to us most recently from Michigan, will be talking to us about an interesting uh, case of uh, inflammatory conjunctivitis. And then finally, Mike will give us a talk about keratoconus and ectasia uh, after refractive surgery and, and specifically the detection of that. I'm going to bow out as a modulate, moderator uh, a little early for surgery. But with that, I'll turn it over to Brett. Everyone, it's nice to meet you. Um, like Dr. Mifflin said, I'm Brett Gudgel, one of the uh, Corny Fellows. Let me get my screen pulled up here for us. And uh, I did my residency at the D. McGee Institute in Oklahoma City, but I've really enjoyed being here at Salt Lake. It's been a great experience so far. Can you all see my screen okay? Yes, if you can. Perfect. All right, so um, today I kind of want to cover a brief, um, really an update uh, on keratoprostheses and also kind of an overview on some um, keratoprostheses that we might not be as familiar with. And so it's a really big topic, a lot to cover, um, hard to cover in such a short time, but I'll try to do kind of an overview. And I think to get a good appreciation of where we are now, I think it's always important to look back at history. And so kind of looking back at the history of uh, keratoprosthesis, it's a really interesting um, article on kind of the history of this in Dr. Manis's book on the history of corneal transplantation. And um, really the first idea came about um, in 1789 with a French surgeon, I'm gonna to totally butcher his name, I think Guillaume Pilier. Um, and so he kind of described, uh, Dr. Mifflin's laughing at me, he's kind of described a, uh, his idea of what a keratoprosthesis would be like and essentially a piece of glass and a silver frame. Um, and I thought the interesting part is he's talking about fitting it in place and so that the sclera can exactly adapt to it by secreting new juices. So kind of an interesting idea of how the healing process has worked back then. And he also had some interesting tips um, for the procedure itself, some pearls, if you will. He, he recommended choosing a clear day for the operation because back then you didn't have an operating microscope. Uh, you had to kind of operate by the light from the window. Um, then he also recommended the lids being held open by assistants. And I imagine this is kind of the first role of the cornea fellow back in the 1700s. And then you bandage the eye for eight days and just kind of hope it takes. And if it didn't, then you just re-bandage for another eight days. And I like this little excerpt at the end here. One could also, for increased security, fix the artificial cornea using two or three sutures. So just in case you want a little extra security, you could suture it in place. And over here, you can see he designed, you know, he's pretty serious about this. He designed the prosthesis. He made some tools for it. And, uh, but actually never ended up doing it um, until a few years later where he just thought that his brother actually did the first one in human, which uh, failed. But from that point on, there's been many future attempts at keratoprosthetics and, uh, and many complications and failures. If you can imagine, they're doing this in a time without, you know, ocular antibiotics, without the knowledge of the pathophysiology of glaucoma, without anti-inflammatory medications. So it's just really kind of set up to not do well. And then eventually came the introduction of the penetrating keratoplasty and the interest in keratoprosthesis declined as we started getting better results with penetrating keratoplasty. But there still remained, even despite the success of PKs, some conditions with high risk of graft failures um, that kind of re reignited the interest in keratoprosthetics. And so that takes us into kind of the modern era um, where we are now. And so essentially a, a keratoprosthesis is indicated in patients whose standard ca penetrating keratoplasty is going to perform poorly. Just to name a few indications, you know, limbal stem cell failure, aniridia, chemical injuries, Stevens-Johnson syndrome, extensive corneal vascularization, repeat graft failures, 
And there's numerous designs. This is not at all an extensive or exhaustive list here, um, but some of the more commonly used ones is, are the Boston Type 1 care prosthesis. So oftentimes people just call that a K-Pro for short, um, and the osteo-odonto care prosthesis, which is a little more commonly used in Europe. Some other designs that I, at least I wasn't initially as familiar with uh, are the Moscow Eye Microsurgery Complex in Russia, or abbreviated the MICOF, the Alpha Core, and the Caraclear. So kind of briefly covering some of these, um, the Boston K-Pro Type 1 is developed in 1960s at Mass Eye and is FDA approved in 1992. And the design has an anterior plate of PMMA with an optical stem. And then there's a snap-on titanium back plate. And there's a donor cornea that's kind of sandwiched between the two plates and it's sutured into place like a typical uh, keratoplasty. But like many keratoprosthetics, there's a, a lot of complications with these, um, just to name a few, infection, uh, tissue melt, necrosis, glaucoma, you can have lots of inflammation issues, retinal issues, um, retroprosthetic membranes and infections like endophthalmitis as well. So you can see here in the pictures on the right, you see some infiltrate around the prosthesis, and then you see some corneal melting in the bottom right picture there. But to address this, the Boston K-Pro team has done a good job of continually modifying the, um, the prosthetic. And so some of the modifications that have been made throughout the years are daily topical vancomycin to help really decrease the risk of infection. They put holes in the back plate, which really helps kind of um, allow the, the donor cornea to get nutrition and, and decrease the rate of melt. Um, continuous contact lens wear to help prevent breakdown. Uh, the switching from a PMMA uh, back plate, which you can see in the top left photo there, that was the original back plate, to a titanium back plate. Um, helps decrease the risk of retro prosthetic membranes. And then they just made simple adjustments like a click on back, back, back plate to try to make it a little easier to assemble. And so in terms of future, or I guess more recent developments for the K-Pro, um, the Lucia is the um, newest model. It was FDA approved in 2019. And so they kind of tried to address uh, several things here. One of the big things is they want to try to decrease the cost of production and make it um, a little more manageable and economically feasible. Um, and then they changed the back plate to one size. Previously, the, the previous model of K-Pro had two different sizes, one that you typically use for pediatric cases and one for adult cases, but they just kind of split the difference and made one size fits all. They changed the holes from round to more of a pedaloid radial slits. Um, they say that this is more of a production issue in terms of kind of decreasing the strain on the plate whenever they're actually making it, but just looking at it, it seems like you'd have maybe more surface contact area with the aqueous onto the cornea, so could have an extra clinical benefit too, I'm not sure. And one thing that I thought was kind of interesting is they, they really addressed the color specific back plate, so now you can actually just the color. At first, this may seem like a kind of a silly thing to address, but you know, the cosmesis of this can be really um, bothersome to some patients sometimes. And if you kind of think of it on a global health scale, a lot of patients are going to have a, a darker colored iris. And so with the titanium back plate, it can be a pretty noticeable contrast. So they use a, a, a kind of a electrochemical process to be able to coat the back plate and change the color. In terms of future developments for the K-Pro, um, they're currently working in rabbit models to make an integrated intraocular pressure sensor. And so it's uh, kind of located right by the stem of the optic. And uh, they're working on ways to have contact and non-contact ways to um, essentially interrogate the device and figure out what the pressure is. And they've had some pretty um, uh, encouraging results of that so far, some issues with some scar tissue that maybe limits its um, durability, but hopefully we can get that going. And then they're also looking into some new materials to prevent melt, um, particularly around the stem of the optic. So kind of transitioning into the osteodonto care prosthesis or the OOKP. This was actually introduced in 1963. This also has a PMMA optic, but interestingly, and the first time I saw this uh, or procedure and when I was reading about it, pretty amazing procedure, they anchor it into autologous tooth and root, um, uh, an alveolar bone. So this is a multi-stage procedure. And so in stage one, they're actually going to harvest the uh, bone graft and prepare the optic. And so you can see them here. That's where they take it. And then they kind of drill a hole, put the PMMA optic in place. Um, and then they're also going to do a mucosal graft over the eye itself. And then they'll take this prosthesis and they'll actually implant it into a soft tissue pocket and allow it to sit there for three months and kind of granulate in, get a lot of fibrovascular tissue. And then stage two, about two to four months later, they're actually going to harvest that opt or that implant and, and kind of trim it to the appropriate size. And then you trepanate the cornea, you go ahead and take out the lens and a lot, and you'll also learn that they've kind of made some modifications where they actually take the iris and also do an anterior vitrectomy and then put that uh, prosthesis in place and then cover it up with a mucosal graft and, and poke a hole in the mucosal graft for the optic to um, come out. <laughs> 
And so just like the other care prosthetics, there's uh, complications for this as well. Some of the similar ones and one that's actually unique to this would be kind of resorption of the bone itself. And so in order to do this, sometimes you can do some kind of imaging. And I thought this is an interesting picture on the right here. This is a radiographic image of um, a patient who actually had a, a OKP in place. And you can see there in the inferior portion of the prosthetic, there's been a significant amount of uh, resorption. So you can actually track that with radiographic imaging. Some modifications that they've made over time with this is the crowd extraction of the lens, the anterior vitrectomy and iris removal. All those steps are mainly to kind of decrease the formation of the retroprosthetic membrane. And then for some rare situations where patients may not have teeth that are uh, good options for the graft, you can actually take tibia fragment. A little quicker um, reabsorption rates with that, but still work pretty well. In terms of looking into future um, uh, ideas for this uh, prosthetic, there's um, hope to expand the visual field. It's a really a pretty narrow visual field with a really long optic to try to get through all those tissue layers. And so trying to widen the optic might give a better field of view. They use some monomycin C to help with anterior membrane formation and also new materials to substitute for bone, which would be more accessible like porous ceramics or even coral skeletons. I thought was interesting just because of the porous nature that would be a good substitute. And then now briefly, just to kind of go over um, some other uh, prosthetics that we might not be as familiar with. This is the Mycoff, like I mentioned. This is a titanium frame with a PMMA optic cylinder. And this is also a two-stage procedure where the first stage, you're gonna insert the plate into a lamellar pocket um, and then wait about three months and then you're gonna implant the PMMA cylinder later. Here's a few pictures of this. You can see on the left, they're actually dissecting out that lamellar pocket and then they slide that um, titanium uh, plate into the pocket. And then this is the beginning of stage two. About three months later, you can see that they're first trephinating that top left um, picture. Um, they're trephinating the um, cornea there, and then they will remove the lens uh, uh, material through that hole, actually, through the video is pretty interesting. And then they'll put in the PMMA optic on the right there. Afterwards, they'll do an anterior vitrectomy through that optic, and this is kind of what the final um, result looks like in the bottom right there. Moving on to the Caraclear. This one's a little different. This is actually a foldable acrylic uh, implant. And this is implanted into a corneal pocket, um, most typically using femtosecond laser, but sometimes they can, there's been some studies that have looked in microkeratome as well. And uh, this is actually not a non-penetrating um, implant. So you're not ever gonna actually go through the posterior decimase and post some of the posterior stroma, but you do trephinate the anterior 3.5 um, millimeters of the cornea. And so some uh, hopeful benefit of not having to actually um, open the anterior chamber there. And this is what it looks like on the right. And then finally, the alpha core, this is a PHEMA um, material, and this is also a two-stage procedure. Uh, the first stage, you're gonna make a stromal pocket, and so they'll kind of do like a 50% um, corneal dissection with that plane. And then the first stage, you're actually gonna uh, trephinate the posterior lamella and make an opening there, put the implant in place, and you'll close that up, let it sit for about three months, and then you'll finish with the anterior lamella opening. And so that's kind of a brief overview and, and looking at this, you know, uh, trying to figure out exactly how you compare these is really difficult. Um, the literature on some of these prostheses are, is, is pretty limited and also the indications are so broad, the visual potential in these eyes can be so variable. Um, and just the metrics that the different studies actually look at um, are, are usually pretty inconsistent and not all studies look at the same things. There really was not one overarching study that could compare these um, different uh, devices, but I was hopeful to get a at least an idea of what these type of things or what these devices, how they're functioning. So I kind of did a very, very crude and, and um, not very accurate literature review and just tried to find the best single studies for each of these devices I could. The ones in green here were actually review studies and then the other two were single uh, site just uh, series. If you look here, um, out of all the different some highlights here, the OOKP actually had really good visual outcomes compared to the other ones with 52% having 26 or better um, with a pretty good sample size there. Um, unfortunately, Caraclear and, and the Alpha Core struggled a little more in the actual in visual potential um, uh, with the devices. And a lot of these, for reference, the starting point for almost all these studies was count fingers or hand motion. Retention rate wise, the K Pro, the OOKP, and the MyCoff did the best. The Caraclear and the Alpha Core had more difficulties with device retention. And that was actually, if you look to the right, due to the higher melt rate, it was often involved most of the time. Um, that was what lost, uh, led to the loss of the device was a melt.
Um, in terms of retroprosthetic membrane, the MyCoff had uh, the highest complication followed by the Boston Capro. The Boston Capro, though, some of those studies were actually done when they had the PMMA um, backplate, and that uh, membrane rate has decreased after we switched to titanium. Glaucoma um, for the Boston Capro and the OKP. Uh, melting, like we already talked about, the Caraclear and the Alpha Core, and then infection um, was highest in the Boston Capro with endophthalmitis and kind of gradually decreased from there. So kind of in summary, um, you know, there's multiple options. None of them are perfect, but it's, you know, oftentimes for these patients can be better than what they're living with, um, with bilateral corneal blindness. It can be a really beneficial procedure for some patients. And, and luckily there's continued innovation in the field um, with the Lucia and then IOP monitoring. And I think there's some future potentials and some um, desirable changes that we could hopefully see in the future with new biocompatible uh, materials, uh, possible human cell cultures are already looking into this with endothelial cell cultures and row kinase inhibitors. Maybe we could do something for, um, you know, help produce um, or grow new corneal graft uh, tissue. Uh, xenografts, grafts from different species, essentially, see if we can get something going there. Reliable pressure monitoring, and also just increasing cost effectiveness in this new age of medicine, um, and hopefully something that can be easily produced. I know it's a tall order, a lot of different things to consider, but I think we could get there eventually. And so that's all I have. Here are my references. So this is a hey, Dr. Olson, uh, Brett. Welcome. Good to have you. So a great summary. Uh, it's 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 very interesting. I I put in my first keratoprosthesis, prosthesis. Oh, I hate to admit it. Forty five years ago, and uh, um, it was a person who had been bare light perception for about fifteen years, and uh, I'll never forget that uh, it was one of those unusual twenty thirty uncorrected the day after surgery. It was, it was just, it was just dynamic. And uh, the patient was so incredibly happy. We, we ended up in this particular case having to pull the lids down around it. It, it was an old Stevens Johnson, which still don't do particularly well. And uh, the interesting things that bothered uh, the patient was that uh, she, she couldn't close her eyes. So she, she uh, had to develop kind of a little thing she'd put over when she wanted to, you know, to close out the light, uh, but loved it. And as you would expect with Steven Johnson for that early PMMA, ended up having a little melt that we didn't see, developed endophthalmitis and lost the eye. So mm -hmm. the same kind of problems that we talked about. And then I, I, I did another one not long after that, and it was not being able to monitor and uh, take care of glaucoma. Uh, and so th these these are the same problems that uh, you know to continue to persist, uh, and, and and it's interesting to see how it's evolved as you as you discuss the field, that it's a niche area, but for those who need it is very important. Is there there hasn't really been any dramatic breakthrough. There's just been a a slow improvement in these different areas, but the same problems exist now that existed then, and adding them all together over a long period of time, sadly, but still uh, the majority of patients uh, uh, end up, if they're going to try to have one for 10 years. The last I reviewed, I don't know if you saw a study on this, but I think the general consensus is the, that you know, over half within 10 years, more like 70% are going to have a significant complication. So mm -hmm. that's, that's kind of where we are. Uh, and uh, I, I like the idea because glaucoma is often still you know, so hard to monitor. These eyes are so aberrant uh, that it's uh, that uh, uh, it's it's hard to know exactly how we measure that pressure. Uh, I saw a couple of these uh, odonto keratoprostheses in Saudi Arabia. They were going to Spain to get them while I was there. They are the weirdest looking thing, but uh, it's amazing. One of them had been very successful for about eight years, another for about five years. So. Uh, a lot of work and a lot of effort, but uh, uh, you know, it maybe, maybe you know, using the patient's own tooth and own tissue, maybe, maybe, you know, that's that's something that uh, you know was relatively viable. But boy, do they look strange! Absolutely, yeah, that's great comments, and yeah, I, I hopefully we can continue to make some bigger steps. It's, it does seem, I agree, like it's a little step by step progress, but hopefully there'll be some kind of material breakthrough or something in the near future. Because it can yeah, I like that. being able to sense, have a sensor there that can tell us mm -hmm. what the pressure is so that we, we really have a, a good idea and can monitor it and try to control it. 
rather than just largely, it's largely watch the optic nerve. And uh, by the time you, you can see the changes that, that are important, um, typically you've had some pretty high pressure for a while and it's very hard pressure to control. You don't have a lot of good options. Absolutely. Any other comments or if not, we can uh, move forward with uh, Eric Weinlander's presentation. Sounds great. Thanks, Brett. All right. Okay. Uh, can everyone see the slides okay? Yep. Great. We're good. All right. So shifting gears a little bit. Um, so uh, we'll do a case uh, presentation as a way to uh, discuss this condition uh, a little bit more. So my very creatively titled a conjunctival lesion. So the center's around a 19 year old woman who came in with uh, redness and uh, discomfort in the right eye for about three months. Um, she had seen an outside ophthalmologist and hadn't improved at all uh, with steroid or antibiotic eye drops. Um, past medical history is notable uh, for psoriasis and atopic dermatitis and alopecia, as well as a uh, remote history of uh, absence uh, seizures. Uh, she was on uh, systemic uh, medications, including uh, an uh, IL-4 inhibitor, uh, dupixent, and methotrexate, as well as some anti-seizure medications, and uh, some topical uh, uh, medications as well for her psoriasis and atopic dermatitis. And uh, interestingly, in addition to the dupixent, uh, she's been on some sort of uh, systemic immunosuppression, uh, starting with cyclosporine uh, from age 16, so for at least the past three years or so. Um, this uh, issue that she started having uh, with the redness and irritation uh, started a, a few months ago when she started taking dupixent. Um, there are reports of dupixent associated conjunctivitis, so it's initially chalked up to that. Um, but the symptoms persisted and were getting worse, and, uh, getting worse uh, so she uh, came to U of U uh, for evaluation. Uh, so this is uh, what she looked like uh, on presentation. Um, so her acuity in the right eye was 2060, uh, the affected eye in 2025 in the left. Uh, normal pressures, uh, normal pupils, uh, motility, visual fields, and fundus exam. Um, but uh, uh, what this picture demonstrates is sort of the most notable feature of her exam, uh, which is uh, this very large area of injection, and then this uh, sort of mass, uh, this fleshy mass uh, on the limbus uh, straddling. Uh, into the cornea as well, uh, with uh, some uh, leukoplakic, some white lesions, uh, parts of it as well. Um, and it was uh, notably uh, somewhat mobile, um, although she was uh, a little bit difficult uh, to examine. So, uh, sort of stepping back, this would normally, if we were in the, the auditorium, be the point where I would torture a resident as I myself have been tortured uh, with questions during grand rounds. Um, but uh, the differential is essentially inflammatory and infectious uh, conjunctivitis, scleritis, sclerokeratitis, super broad differential, um, granulomatous disease or flictinulosis. Um, this really wasn't that likely. Uh, it was certainly ruled out in her workup. Uh, she did get a systemic autoimmune workup, which is negative. Some cultures were taken. But given the sort of uh, the mass lesion uh, appearance, uh, this was really thought to be more consistent uh, with the neoplastic disorder. Um, and uh, for the differential, uh, for a, a limbus-based uh, conjunctival uh, tumor, um, essentially thinking either uh, benign uh, squamous papilloma or potentially a uh, malignant condition uh, along the OSSN uh, or CIN spectrum. So uh, in terms of workup, next step um, uh, would be biopsy. So an excisional biopsy was performed for this patient. Uh, it was using the uh, no-touch technique, uh, which is reviewed here uh, from a 1994 paper. Um, it, essentially, the idea is that you want to excise uh, the tumor in question uh, in its entirety uh, on block and with only touching normal tissue. Um, so the uh, original uh, description uh, of, the, of this uh, technique is applying absolute alcohol uh, to, the, to the tumor um, and then uh, performing epithelial, epithelial debridement of the cornea where you sort of peel back the epithelium 
and fold it uh, on uh, onto the tumor. And then you take generous uh, four millimeter margins, uh, which uh, you cut down um, the conjunctiva, uh, and then uh, perform a, a dissection underneath the tumor, and in some cases needing to take a partial thickness uh, sclerectomy as well to ensure uh, that the tumor is excised uh, in its entirety. And again here, just grasping um, only normal tissue. Uh, oftentimes, this is paired with a double freeze thaw uh, cryotherapy around the uh, edges uh, and uh, sometimes to the bed, as well as the addition of uh, uh, either a topical chemotherapy or anti metabolite. So, this is performed in our patient. And again, another wasted opportunity to torture residents. Uh, here's the pathology. Uh, so, I'll do my best at uh, providing an interpretation. Um, so, uh, notable features uh, in the, the histopathology specimen is a thickened or acanthotic squamous epithelium, which you can kind of outline here. There's keratin pearls here at the black arrows, uh, and then these notable uh, vascular cores uh, as well at the white arrows here. So these features with the uh, acanthotic uh, epithelium uh, and uh, formed around these vascular cores uh, was most consistent uh, with the sessile conjunctival uh, papilloma. So shifting more to the benign spectrum of uh, the uh, uh, neoplasia that uh, we had considered. So we'll talk a little bit about uh, conjunctival squamous papilloma, um, uh, sort of its uh, presentation and current thoughts on management. Um, so uh, these tumors uh, typically are uh, exophytic, meaning they're either sessile or pedunculated. So sessile like ours was, or pedunculated where they arise from a central stalk. Uh, sometimes you can, very rarely, uh, they can be uh, inverted to more of a mucoepidermoid carcinoma. Um, they're sort of typified uh, both on histology and on uh, the clinical exam uh, as having these vascular cores of the squamous epithelium, uh, which you can see as these fine uh, papillary vessels, uh, which are sometimes called uh, hairpin vessels, which you can kind of make out uh, in uh, this picture here. Importantly, uh, conjunctival squamous papillomas as uh, benign uh, tumors uh, are mobile over the underlying tissue uh, in contrast to malignant tumors uh, showing uh, episclerosis, scleral invasion, uh, which tend to be fixed. Um, these tumors, although they are benign, uh, can display uh, some uh, dysplastic uh, features either uh, under the, the microscope after uh, uh, excisional biopsy or manifesting clinically as keratinization, uh, as in our patient, uh, the keratin pearls and the, the leukoplakia kind of go together, uh, symbolophoron or inflammation, and uh, palpebral involvement, all of which uh, betray some uh, degree of dysplasia. Uh, in addition, uh, papillomas can certainly be recurrent, and uh, you can have more than one, um, uh, which is more common uh, in patients who have uh, HPV as the driving factor, and also multiple conch papillomas are more common in children compared to adults. Um, uh, in terms of demographics, uh, the typical age of presentation is uh, 21 to 40. So our 19-year-old patient is sort of uh, right on the fence for you know, fitting the, the, the typical patient. So lesions tend to be slow growing um, uh, and typically present with foreign body sensation or irritation. Although as in our patient, you can certainly have significant inflammation. They can present anywhere on the uh, bulbar uh, tarsal palpebral conjunctiva. Um, and uh, the only established uh, risk factor is uh, HPV, uh, which in, uh, depending on the study that, that you read can be you know, about half to 90% of the papillomas. Uh, interestingly, our patient uh, had some degree of immunosuppression for several years. Um, there's certainly a thought that for uh, malignant ocular surface squamous uh, neoplasia, uh, that, that, that immunosuppression can certainly play a role, uh, especially as seen in, in patients with HIV. Um, but there's no definitive evidence linking uh, immune dysfunction uh, to benign conjunctival squamous papilloma. The same is said uh, for UV exposure and smoking. Uh, in addition, uh, the uh, clinical presentation and behavior of these lesions uh, sort of uh, 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 sequesters almost into two age groups. Um, although these tumors are much more common in adults, about six times more common, uh, children are more likely to have larger lesions, multiple lesions, 
um, have treatment failure, and then get uh, 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 recurrence. <coughs> Um, so in terms of diagnosis, um, so sort of, I think, a, a little controversial uh, if, if these can be diagnosed purely on, on clinical features and, and treated as such. Uh, but certainly, uh, when in doubt, uh, excisional biopsy is, is, uh, is called for, as these lesions can sometimes be difficult uh, to distinguish clinically uh, from a, a malignant tumor. In addition uh, to uh, clinical diagnosis and excisional biopsy, impression cytology is, is reported uh, as a way to look at the dysplasia uh, of the cells uh, non-invasively. And high-resolution OCT um, has uh, been a modality uh, that's been really heralded um, uh, by the folks in Bascom as a way to help to diagnose and parse out uh, the nature of uh, ocular surface tumors, and then uh, really seems to have its uh, greatest use as an adjunct uh, to quantify and track uh, response to treatment uh, non-invasively. Uh, and in terms of management, um, so uh, there's a lot of different options actually uh, for conjunctival squamous uh, papilloma. Um, so well, one of the mainstays is uh, excision uh, with uh, cryotherapy around the margins and uh, oftentimes paired either with interferon or an antimetabolite uh, to the tumor bed during the time of surgery. Uh, there's certainly reports of cryotherapy alone, just uh, sort of spot cryo uh, to the lesions in question. Um, and then medical options include oral cimetidine, which is a, a histamine antagonist that at high doses uh, can have uh, uh, antiviral and uh, anti uh, the, uh, proliferative effects. Um, interferon, either topically as a drop um, or uh, intralesionally as an injection. Uh, and then the anti metabolites, uh, including mitomycin C and 5 fluorouracil. Um, there's also some reports of using photodynamic therapy or even photocoagulation of the lesions, um, although these are certainly more experimental um, and are often advocated as an alternative in uh, low resource settings. So given all, all these options, um, there's a lot of uh, different ways you can approach it. Um, it seems to me looking at the literature that, that the standard of care uh, is either a, a trial of a topical interferon alone, uh, so you make a clinical diagnosis, you say this is a papilloma, and you treat the interferon to either uh, shrink or resolve the lesion, um, or to just go ahead and, and proceed with uh, uh, excision of cryotherapy uh, with or without uh, adjunctive interferon or antimetabolite at the time of surgery. Uh, then the other, uh, other options are more, uh, they have a greater role as a secondary uh, agents, second line or adjunctive treatments. Uh, so the oral cement Metadine is uh, often best used uh, in, in children uh, or in patients uh, who have uh, multiple uh, papillomas. Uh, interferon, uh, other than as a primary agent, can be used as an adjunct, uh, both topically or intralesionally. Um, downsides are that it's expensive and the intralesional uh, injection tends to have a flu-like uh, 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 symptomatology afterwards. Um, and the antimetabolites uh, are also tend to be used more as an adjunct uh, or second line uh, uh, for things such as uh, recurrence, um, and you can run into ocular surface toxicity issues, especially with mitomycin C as compared to 5-FU. Um, and similarly for cryotherapy, more so as, as, as an adjunct uh, to either interferon monotherapy or excision. Um, and when we think about our topical options, uh, so interferon is sort of the one that is touted uh, as, as the preferred uh, topical therapy in, in the literature. Uh, it's, it's effective, it's well tolerated, but it's very expensive. Um, and uh, these patients can uh, remain on it for uh, quite some time. So interferon is uh, given as one million, one million uh, international units uh, four times a day until resolution, which tends to be about four months. Um, so that can be uh, quite expensive. Uh, sort of as a second line or alternative, um, as a five or uracil, uh, which is uh, much cheaper um, but you start to run into toxicity issues, and this is usually given as a cycle of uh, one week on, three weeks off, um, and uh, sometimes even one month on, three months off. And then mitomycin C typically is treated as a third line, similar uh, cycling as 5-FU, uh, but much higher risk of uh, toxicity issues, including limbal stem cell deficiency.
Um, in terms of the long-term outcome, so these uh, lesions tend to stay benign. Um, so really what you're dealing with is, uh, is recurrence. Um, and the uh, rates of recurrence vary uh, depending on the study, uh, topping out at around uh, 27%, so around a quarter. Um, uh, so close monitoring is certainly called for in these uh, cases. You know, risk for recurrence, uh, uh, it's higher in children. Um, if excision is done alone without any adjunct, so no uh, cryotherapy or chemotherapy at the time of surgery, um, or if the papilloma is located on the bulbar conjunctiva or spreads into the cornea, which uh, unfortunately includes our patient. Interestingly, there's no association with recurrence risk uh, and HPV or HPV subtype, even though HPV is considered to be uh, one of the main drivers of this condition. Uh, and similarly, uh, the amount of dysplasia, it's unclear if, if uh, the more dysplastic lesions tend to recur, although it is known that recurrent lesions tend to be more dysplastic. So um, kind of going back to our patient presentation, you know, once uh, on exam, it becomes evident that, that this is uh, a, a tumor and a, a ocular surface, uh, uh, some sort of neoplasia, either benign or cancerous. Uh, and then uh, the question becomes, well, okay, now what? We lean towards biopsy. That's certainly the, the best way to get a definitive diagnosis uh, because it can be very difficult uh, to distinguish the, the two uh, just based on clinical criteria. Uh, so uh, we're going to talk a, a little bit about uh, OSSN, uh, ocular surface squamous neoplasia, uh, sort of the, the malignant variety that's adjacent uh, to the papilloma, um, uh, since uh, you're oftentimes considering the, the two simultaneously uh, when you're seeing a patient. So uh, ocular surface squamous neoplasia, uh, it's the most common non-pigmented ocular surface tumor. Um, uh, these things do damage by being locally destructive and invasive. Uh, they rarely tend to metastasize, uh, but you can certainly uh, cause uh, uh, vision uh, problems uh, if left unchecked. Um, they uh, tend to appear gelatinous or leukoplakic. Uh, they can also be papillary and sometimes difficult uh, to distinguish from papilloma. Um, so in contrast uh, to papilloma, which is a little bit of a younger crowd, uh, the OSSN tends to be an older crowd, the 50s and up. Um, if it's occurring in a younger patient, you should consider HIV immunosuppression or uh, xeroderma pigmentosa uh, as uh, potential conditions that predispose to this in young patients. Um, and uh, importantly, um, the uh, OSSN uh, is a spectrum, um, so uh, from dysplasia, to uh, full-blown invasive uh, squamous cell carcinoma uh, with uh, contratival intraepithelial neoplasia graded by the what, how many thirds of epithelium is involved uh, in, in between the two. Treatment um, uh, options are very similar uh, to papilloma. Um, we know that uh, in uh, some retrospective studies, uh, excision uh, with, with cryotherapy has a similar treatment and recurrence rate as uh, merely a local chemotherapy. Um, however, uh, this study did not include those who got excision with uh, a chemotherapy at the time of surgery. Um, so uh, the, the newer option of doing excision with cryo plus local chemotherapy, uh, we don't really know how that compares uh, to excision alone or chemotherapy alone. Um, the role of local chemotherapy, as in interferon, mitomycin, uh, 5-FU, um, is, has been expanding recently, uh, especially with the increased toler tolerability of uh, interferon. Um, uh, it uh, tends to be used, or is very useful uh, for chemo reduction. If it's a large tumor where you would cause a bunch of scarring if you excised all of it. Uh, it's useful as an intraoperative adjuvant, and then also as a postoperative adjuvant, especially if there's positive margins. Um, it, and importantly, um, uh, ocular surface squamous neoplasia does carry a relatively high uh, risk of long-term recurrence. Uh, some, uh, some studies reporting uh, even up to 50%, uh, especially in those with, with positive margins. So, so these patients do need to be monitored. Um, and think about the medical options, uh, same toolkit as for papilloma, uh, where interferon uh, uh, is preferred if, uh, if the patient is, is able to afford to do so because it's, uh, it's effective and it's uh, not toxic. Uh, 
um, whereas the antimetabolites are more of a second line um, due to the increased uh, toxicity and perhaps uh, marginally uh, worse uh, uh, success rates, although that, that hasn't really been borne out. So uh, thinking about the different ways that you can approach a patient with OSSN, um, it's certainly reasonable and there's precedent if it's uh, a, you know, a low risk lesion, uh, that's you know, obviously ocular surface squamous neoplasia. You can start with the interferon alone, and then if that doesn't resolve it, uh, you can do a, a salvage excision uh, with topical or intralesional uh, chemotherapy. Or if it's a big lesion, you can do chemo reduction, uh, potentially with interferon or your antimetabolite of choice, uh, and then followed by excision uh, with cryotherapy and interferon. Or you can just proceed straight to excision uh, if it looks like it's a uh, moderately, uh, you know, small to moderate size lesion where you won't cause uh, local tissue destruction by excising it, um, and then follow that up uh, by a chemo prevention uh, with interferon or an antimetabolite uh, after excision. So dialing back into the uh, uh, land of uh, benign conjunctival lesions and back to our patient. Um, so she underwent uh, excisional biopsy uh, with cryotherapy, uh, demonstrated that it was a, a squamous papilloma. Um, so uh, she was uh, monitored afterwards. There was some concern actually for uh, recurrence, uh, as can happen uh, even up to a quarter of these patients, especially with the higher risk features as an R patient. Um, so she's undergone two additional cycles of topical uh, five uh, fluorouracil, which has resulted in a regression of the recurrence, uh, but then she does have some ongoing inflammation, which is currently being managed. And then in terms of uh, the lesion itself, uh, she's just undergoing uh, active surveillance with us. Um, so I'd like to thank everybody, and especially uh, Dr. Manwes, Dr. Lin, uh, and I've listed a few of my references, and I'm happy to take any questions. Awesome, thanks, Eric. That was a great presentation. Any comments uh, from Dr. Lin or Dr. Manwes? This is Dr. Olson. Um, you know, uh, I've, in the past, some of these that you've had, you'll, you'll have kind of a, a, a relatively larger lesion and multiple smaller lesions. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I don't know, I, I always felt that it was best. I mean, you try to get four millimeter margins around all of those. You've taken a lot of conjunctiva. Mm -hmm is to uh, just excise the, the larger one. You get your tissue diagnosis. And then you just do a freeze-thaw freeze to these smaller satellite lesions and not have to excise them all. So I, I think, at least in my experience, and then, and then you watch, and then you've got other therapies. And uh, if it recurs, then, then you, know, you may have to do something uh, additional. But, but I, don't, I just, my experience was you don't always have to uh, excise these. It often a freeze-thaw freeze cycle for these smaller lesions uh, was quite effective. I'm curious what you know, Dr. Mam, what, uh, you know, Dr. Mifflin or Dr. Lynn, you know, feel about that. I think uh, Dr. Lynn and Dr. Mammals are both co-hosts now, so I think you can unmute yourself if you have a comment. Um, yeah, so I just, I had a comment that um, I, I did not do the four millimeter wide excisions because that would be pretty much half for full bar conjunctiva. Um, so I, I did just probably a one to two millimeter uh, margin in this case. Um, she did have a little bit of involvement of her sclera, so I did have to do a uh, little thin sclerectomy. Um, most commonly, if it's pretty mobile and apart from the sclera, I would not do a sclerectomy. So Amy, this is this is Randy. What what do you think about? Where you have a big lesion and you've got a one or two small satellite lesions that are sitting next to it, just excising the big lesion and just do cryotherapy to the smaller and not excise them. Is that, uh, um, yeah, that used to be acceptable and I used to do that. I'm just wondering if that's still reasonable. Um, I, I haven't had that particular instance. Usually I have a smaller focal lesion or I'll have a really, really large. I've had very large lesions. My preference is for large lesions to start with topical interferon if the patient can afford it. And then if there's either no response or insufficient response, then I'll go back in and, and excise. Um, and I've had like very large bulbar conjunctival lesions um, come down to nothing with interferon. Um, 
And if there's even just a partial response, you have less of an area to sure. excise later on. Um, as far as a large lesion and satellite, I, I haven't done just cryo to satellite lesions. Okay. All right, well, that was a great case. I think we'll, in the interest of time, just keep moving. And uh, Mike Murray is going to give us a great talk on screening for uh, subclinical keratoconus and refractive evals. Uh, before we do, Dr. Mamlitz, you've been unmuted. So if you want to make your comment, you can. Can everyone hear me here? I don't know if we're waiting for Dr. Mamlis or not. Just want to check my sound though. We can hear you. you All right. Can hear me. It's Nick Hello? Hey, Dr. Mamlis, you're very quiet. We could barely hear you. Just barely. Barely. Boy, I've got it turned up to 100%. My headphones must not be working. Can you hear me at all if I yell? Yell, yell. We can get, we can barely make it, but we can hear you, Nick. Yell. Okay, I'm sorry. My headphones just must not be working while well. I've got them turned up to 100%. The problem with these squamous papillomas is they can have some significant atypia and uh, some features that look dysplastic, as was talked about, including the keratinization, the keratin pearls, they can have nucleoli in them. But the critical factor is, is the basement membrane is absolutely intact throughout. So even though these can look fairly aggressive, they're strictly intraepithelial. And, and even on this one, there were some aggressive features when you looked at the pathology. And so these patients need to be watched very carefully for possible recurrence. So uh, Nick is making a very good point, and that is we like to think of these in specific categories. And uh, there's a continuum. And so we've got to recognize that uh, uh, where we've got something that represents a continuum, then they kind of act halfway between these different categories and have got to be followed accordingly. Just, just briefly from a historical, I mean, the, the original work on trying to figure all this out in morphology was, was to categorize in very distinctive small morphological buckets. And as time goes on and we learn more about etiology of these, we realize that uh, many of the things we deal with are a spectrum and there isn't really a clean, we, we still call them in those because it's helpful and how they respond, but, but to remember that a lot, a lot of these different uh, categories are truly a spectrum and have to be recognized as such. Absolutely, that's great discussion, um, all great points. Um, and so we'll keep going here with Mike Murray. Go ahead and get started. All right, uh, my name is Mike Murray. I'm a PGY3. Um, I am Glad to be invited by Brett and Eric and Dr. Mifflin to present some information from a review project that I was involved in recently uh, about detecting precariconus in refractive surgery screening. So with the advent of uh, LASIK and PRK uh, in the you know, early 90s to late 90s, um, there was a, a spike in post-refractive surgery ectasia. One of the first cases was reported by reports began to increase about this post-refractive surgery complications. And uh, this has become one of the most important issues in refractive surgery is screening for proper candidates in the surgery. Um, and I'm going to focus in this talk a little bit about uh, keratoconus, although there's other conditions such as, you know, pellucid marginal degeneration and others that could be discussed. And a little bit about uh, some of the different screening methods uh, that have uh, been developed over the years. Uh, so first, a little bit about keratoconus. Uh, one of the first classification systems was the Ansler Kramic uh, table on the left there. Uh, that was developed in the 1960s, mainly 
uh, based on the mean keratometry centrally, and then also refraction, um, and then some slit lamp criteria such as scarring. Um, later on in the 1970s and 80s, there was development of the Placido disc technology where rings that were concentrically oriented were uh, shown on the cornea with a you know, bigger space, meaning a flatter area of the cornea and steeper uh, space, meaning a thinner area of those Placido rings. And over the years, some of these indices were developed. One of them in the 1990s was called the Kai uh, compared, uh, among other things, five points of the superior cornea to five points on the inferior cornea uh, and the steep uh, kind of K values between those, as well as uh, the level of astigmatism um, and then the SRAX, which is a comparison of how irregular astigmatism is uh, compared to how and uh, another system that was developed, this was by a, a Dr. Randleman, uh, was the ERSS, Ectasia Risk Score System, um, which went through, you know, inferior steepening, abnormal topography, thickness, uh, preoperative kind of manifest spherical equivalent. And all of these were uh, good systems for uh, looking at keratoconus before screening for refractive surgery. 2015, all of these societies got together, the Asia Cornea Society, Cornea Society of the U.S., the European, the Pan American, in a uh, global consensus on keratoconus and tried to come up with a uniform uh, definition and screening system for keratoconus, and they weren't able to do it. They didn't agree on a new staging system. So unfortunately, just as the background, uh, kind of like Dr. Olson was alluding to, keratoconus is a big spectrum and uh, not very well defined, especially the kind of subclinical or preclinical uh, forms of keratoconus. So some of these definitions of keratoconus um, have derived from uh, the fact that it's known to be uh, almost universally a bilateral disease, although it may manifest in different uh, levels of severity between eyes. So forum frus keratoconus has uh, sometimes been described as the other eye in an eye, uh, in a uh, patient that has a keratoconic eye, uh, and has sometimes been compared to normal eyes. A keratoconus suspect has often been defined as someone with normal uh, appearing visual acuity and slit lamp findings. Um, it doesn't have, you know, a you know, retinoscopy, scissoring reflex, or any of those, you know, Munson lid signs with the lid or the rizzuti, the cornea conical reflection uh, when you shine nasally, um, the flesh ring or any of those things, but that has abnormal findings on scans such as uh, topography. And for the purpose of this talk, and honestly, what we uh, recommended in our review paper was that a lot of these vague terms be just uh, lumped into the category of pre-keratoconus. And uh, the difficulty in screening and what I'll kind of talk about is we have uh, historically and with the advent of some new technology, some pretty good methods at determining when an eye is keratoconic and shouldn't undergo refractive surgery, but it's more difficult in determining these pre-keratoconic eyes and detecting them important to detect these pre-keratoconic eyes uh, as well as the ones with frank keratoconus. So uh, this is a description a little bit about a new technology that was developed in the early kind of 2000s and rolled out in the 2010s, uh, shine fluid imaging. And so instead of just using a direct placido disc image uh, straight on the cornea, uh, shine fluid imaging uses a uh, technology in order to align an image plane and have a subject plane off to an angle. And when you think about looking at the cornea at a slit lamp, this is key. Uh, the difficulty, and I don't know if we have any photographer gurus out there, is uh, making sure that you're in focus uh, across an entire image. So if you look at this train, for example, without shine fluke imaging, you could get maybe one of these train cars in focus, but you couldn't get the entire train in focus. And it involves kind of a mathematical uh, adjustment of the lens plane such that the image plane, the subject plane, the lens plane are all able to intersect at a certain point. Um, 
And what the Pentacam, which I'll, what I'll talk about uh, a little bit in detail, does is it rotates a uh, camera around to get 25,000 data points. Because of these data points, they were able to do an analysis not just on the right, which would be a topographical image uh, of elevations, but instead a tomographical image. So the surface of the front cornea, the surface of the back surface of the cornea, and also thickness and technology. So what we did is reviewed uh, all of the studies that had compared these uh, pre-keratoconic eyes with normal eyes. We were looking for indices that would provide an area under the curve of 0.8 or greater. Uh, so basically, uh, if you compare a true positive to false positive, a value of 0.5 basically means it's a wash. A value of 1 is perfect and a value of 0.8 is pretty good. Um, this is an example of one of the indices, and if you could just see uh, the area under the curve for this indice, which is, uh, I'll describe a little bit later, it was pretty popular. So these were a couple of the indices that we uh, found that were good for pre screening. Uh, one is the Bell and Ambrosio Enhanced Ictasia Display, Ambrosio Relational Thickness, Packing Metric, Progression Indices, and the Index of Vertical Asymmetry. And I'll go through a little bit about these here just briefly. So uh, on the Pentacam, this is a, a corneal thickness spatial profile. So basically it compares how thick are things at zero on your left, which is central cornea, out to the uh, peripheral cornea and the diameter. And it should uh, progress and they have um, kind of mean values in a standard deviation there of a, a normal cornea. And then the bottom one is a percentage thickness increase. So how see here, this is a, a thin cornea on the left uh, and then a uh, urticonic cornea on the right. As you can see on the right, it dips below that uh, corneal thickness, meaning it is getting uh, thinner quicker than you would want it to. So uh, one of these indices is the Bell and Ambrosio Enhanced Ectatic Display. This is a uh, kind of a standard deviation from uh, a bunch of different values. So mean anterior ele elevation, posterior elevation compared to those shapes that it should be a, a kind of an ellipsoid shape on the posterior and anterior surface. And this pachymetric progression, uh, the thinnest corneal thickness, and then uh, a value called ambrosia relational thickness. The ambrosia relational thickness is kind of cool. It takes uh, a value of how thin the cornea is, just a simple pachymetric value, and then how quickly it's thinning out with this percentage thickness increase and it just divides it. So it lets you know how thick and how fast it's getting thick. Um, with these indices, uh, a pretty reliable uh, evaluation of the subclinical keratoconus is able to be uh, manifest. And as we're kind of short on time, uh, these were just kind of like a cheat sheet that we put in our new paper of values that are useful um, to detect both clinical keratoconus and subclinical keratoconus. Finally, just a couple conclusions. Um, advances in corneal tomography, such as Pentacam, and then we did some other evaluations like Galilei, provide information about the posterior corneal surface and help uh, to create these indices that are pretty reliable for not just detecting keratoconus, but these pre-keratoconus uh, patients. Um, future work needs to be done, like we talked about with the standardization of keratoconus, uh, maybe a global summit or something, we'll, we'll be able to get that. Obviously, screening carefully for pre keratoconus patients uh, will help us to do the first uh, do no harm, and especially in these refractive surgery patients where ectasia can be really debilitating and tough to deal with. If you want further information, uh, these are the titles of the review. Uh, we weren't able to go over the Galilei and then also uh, some of the corneal biomechanical uh, systems like Corvus that use a, a puff of air and then analyze. Lastly, big thanks to Dr. Mifflin for helping with the presentation and Dr. Moshefar, uh, as well as being a mentor and being involved in the research here and a couple of my uh, resources and happy to take any questions. Awesome. Thanks, Mike. That was a, a really good talk. I think, uh, you know, in the interest of time, we might have time for a comment, but otherwise uh, we could probably just email Mike if you have any questions or comments. Um, sorry for going a little bit over today. A little uh, technical difficulty there for a second, but I uh, appreciate everyone joining us today. Mm -hmm.